Hey, welcome back. We talked at the top of the broadcast about how politically contentious anything involving immigration has become, more so even than during the 2012 presidential campaign. We talked about the politics of it and the wild claims surrounding it, the scare tactics, hyperbole, but also the real policy failures in dealing with it. At the end of the day, though, this is a profoundly human story that begins for many in some of Central America's poorest and most violent countries, then moves north from crossing points along Mexico's southern border to border towns in this country. We are in both places tonight, starting with a Gary Tuckman who's live on the Mexico-Guatemala border. Gary? Anderson, when people cross from Mexico into the United States, they have to do it clandestinely. It's potentially dangerous and expensive. They hire coyotes that cost hundreds or thousands of dollars. But right now I'm in Guatemala. This is a river that separates Guatemala from Mexico across the way. And these are rafts that you see in the river. All you need here, it's not expensive. All you need here is a little more than a buck to get on the raft. It's easy and it's open. This is the Suchiate River, which separates Mexico from Guatemala. Right now we're in Guatemala, the westernmost part of the country, across the river, the southernmost part of Mexico. And you can see throughout this river, there are rafts of people who are trying to get across the border and they're doing it very easily. This is very unlike the border going to the United States where you have to be secret about it. I want to give you a look here to give you an idea of how open this is. There are police here. There are police all over here. And no one minds that people are going across the river from here in Guatemala into Mexico. You can see this family of three, a mother, father, and their little boy. They told me a short time ago they're getting ready to go on this raft. The rafts are made of these huge inner tubes, and they're getting ready to go across from here in Guatemala into Mexico. They're hoping also to get into the United States. This river is active from sunrise to sunset, and in addition to all the police being here not caring that people are crossing from here in Guatemala to Mexico, what's really amazing is about a mile in this direction is the official border station. The official border station is right down there, so even though the Border Patrol people for Guatemala and Mexico work over there, they don't seem to care either. This is just a very active business, and the going rate right now for crossing is the equivalent of $1.30. And this is the family we just met, the little child and his parents. The man in the red shirt with the stick, he's the pilot of this raft, and he's the guy who just got the $1.30. Typically what happens, they will go to the other side, they will go into Mexico. There are taxis and vans and also bicycle taxis on the other side, which will take them in a lot of cases to a nearby city in Mexico called Tapachula. In Tapachula, they stay in shelters and then try to figure out where to go from there. But it is a long way from Tapachula, Mexico, the southern part of Mexico, right near here to the United States. It could take them weeks to get there if they get there successfully. And that's an open question. The police are not only friendly here, they're actually encouraging us to go for a ride in one of the rafts. They're saying, yeah, go into Mexico. So we are. And this is our skipper. Your name, sir? Paluco. This is Paluco. Paluco, we, we paid him $1.30 already to go on the raft with him. Paluco, um, is this a fun job? Divertido? Yeah, it's fun. Fun? Facile, easy? Easy job. You like taking people into Mexico? Oh, sure. Okay, well, people leave Guatemala, come with Paluco, he takes them to Mexico, and then if they succeed, they end up in the United States. But if you do this in the Rio Grande in Texas, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You can't do it in front of cops. But here with Paluco, you can do it in front of everybody. Paluco is now taking us into Mexico, but unlike most of the people on this river, we're gonna head back into Guatemala and spend the next couple of hours watching people continue to cross this river heading north. I mean, it's amazing just in this leg, Gary, how easy it is. Are people on the rafts you talk to, though, are they worried about what's ahead of them? I mean, you've seen, you know, kids riding on the top of trains. It's incredibly dangerous. A lot can happen to these kids along the way. Hey, we've been here for a couple of hours, Anderson. This young lady right here, she's about to head to Mexico. She wants to eventually meet her family in the United States. She's a little shy right now. People we've been talking to aren't scared. They're a bit apprehensive, they're anxious, they're nervous, they're excited. But everyone we've talked to knows someone who successfully made it to the United States and says they have a better life there. And that's why they want to do it too. One more thing I want to tell you, Anderson, just to make clear, the coyotes who take you from Mexico to the United States charge hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands of dollars. But here, that doesn't happen. I mean, you can cross for free in some spots. You can walk across some of the water at Sochella, but right here, literally, is $1.30. That's all it takes to get into Mexico and start your journey to the United States. Wow, Gary, appreciate that. Thanks very much. For, from that border, Migrants make their way north through Mexico into Texas. Now, many families are caught. Some turn themselves in. After initial processing, the overburdened system, in so many words, hand them off to others with a few pieces of paper, including one requiring that they go before a court that will almost certainly send them back home. Rosa Flores picks up the story in McAllen, Texas. 
After traveling hundreds of miles, the Central American families find a glimmer of hope at a temporary shelter at Sacred Heart Catholic Church in McAllen, Texas. Entonces, sí, les voy a tomar estos datos rapidito para Most are fleeing violence and poverty in their home countries, arriving exhausted with nothing but the clothing on their backs, laceless shoes, and a manila folder handed to them by immigration officials with documents in English. They say they don't understand. Daisy Villanueva says she traveled with her two-year-old son Stanley by foot and by bus from her home country of Honduras, nearly 1,500 miles, until she made it to America. Then turn herself into immigration authorities. Few meals along the way, the fear and trauma still clear on this family's face. She didn't leave anyone behind, but hopes to reunite with her husband in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Not the case for Sergio Bolaños. He left a wife and two children in Guatemala, making the dangerous journey with his nine-year-old son Vidal, who was anxious to change his dirty clothing and sit down to eat a meal. Pasamos penas, Viera. Hicimos diez días. En bus, en bus, nos venimos. Sergio says he crossed the border and turned himself into immigration, spent three days with his son in a detention center, was assigned a court date to face an immigration judge, and was set free at a bus station. That's how thousands of people end up in temporary shelters like this one. This facility sees between 150 and 180 people a day. Take a look around. It's a quick stop. They get some fresh clothing, a blanket for the road, some shoes, and also some snacks for their bus ride. And if there's time, they get a quick shower. Sister Norma Pimentel established this temporary shelter a month ago and has already served more than 3,000 people. They may be stripped of everything, but one thing they do have is their faith. And so I think this is a beautiful encounter of, of uh, a faith alive, you know, in, amongst our people. It's the common story here. Daisy says she wants to protect her son from the constant sound of gunshots in her neighborhood and the dead bodies on the streets. For Sergio, he says he's escaping the extreme poverty in Guatemala, where he had trouble putting food on the table working in agriculture. As he and his son boarded a bus to reunite with family in California, it was left up to them to honor the immigration court date in that paperwork in the manila folder. Sergio wouldn't say if they plan to show up for the court hearing. Rosa Flores joins us now. So it is confusing about what happens to these immigrants after they're apprehended. After they're processed, they're allowed to go free, as we saw with that, that family, until they're actually scheduled to go to this court hearing, right? You're absolutely right, and that's the crazy part when you really think about it. So here's how this goes down. So a person gets detained here in the Rio Grande River that you see behind me, and they do get processed by immigration. After that, after the fingerprinting and, and the such, then immigration decides they can either wait for their court hearing while they are detained or they are set free. Everyone, Anderson, that we met today was set free. They left on a bus and they're reuniting with their families. And the unaccompanied kids, they're processed differently. They are. Other federal agencies are involved. So, yes, they get detained on the Rio Grande River, like you see here. Um, but then uh, Health and Human Services gets involved. So they get a child wellness exam. They get um, uh, help because their case is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And one of the key things is, one of the goals is to reunite them with their families while they go through the immigration process. And we understand that about 85% of these unaccompanied children are reunited with their families while they wait for the immigration process to go through. And I can tell you from sources that I've been talking to, they tell us that it'll take about a year and a half for these children to get processed because it just takes that long to go through the immigration court process in the U.S. All right, Rosa Flores, Anderson. I appreciate the update. Thanks very much. Up next, former New Orleans mayor.